we have about half an hour for a discussion to try and combine online dating, leadership, war and peace. Um, and I would like to start with Mr. Exelrod. Um, you said um, that being reelected isn't equivalent to leadership. It's not the right measurement. And Israel's prime minister was recently reelected. And according to the parameters that you presented here today, is he a leader as you presented it with the courage that is needed for a leader? Well, thank you for making me first. <laughs> And um, as you can appreciate, uh, I, I spent a lifetime in politics, so I'm going to skillfully navigate around your question. I had to try. <laughs> but um, should I, I, should I, I think... translate? You will say what you want to say politically, and I'll translate what it means. <laughs> I, heard, I heard your presentation. I don't think so. <laughs> But, uh, but I do want to ask you, if you are 5'9", and you need to be 5'10", to get the date, why not just buy a, a shoes with larger heels? They, they find out eventually. Oh, it I see. Work. It's a short if it term, goes well. It's a short-term strategy. <laughs> um, look, I think that, um, you know, President Kennedy wrote a book called Profiles in Courage, and there were only, I think, six entries in the book, because courage is not the norm. The norm is to do what's necessary uh, to, to perpetuate yourself in office. Um, and so the kinds of steps that are necessary to make peace are going to require courage. And the people who take them will be the next entries in those books. But let me just say one thing about, uh, two things about what the professor said. Uh, because I thought, because they were, uh, they, they, they spoke, I think our, our presentations merged at points. One is uh, that people see, believe that the status quo will endure, even if rationally it can't. And it makes move, movement, uh, when the status quo is uh, relatively tranquil, hard uh, to do politically. And we saw that in healthcare. You know, uh, people, you know, they, most people had healthcare. They didn't see the problems coming down the line with the system and they were more afraid of what they would lose than what they would gain. And, you know, the same as, the, obviously, the analogy and the analysis applies here as well. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna characterize any one leader's uh, actions, but I know it's gonna require uh, courage to, to, to defy those uh, fundamental rules that uh, the professor spoke to, or analysis. Yeah, I mean, there is a problem uh, that any reform, any change, involves gainers and losers. And the losers tend to fight much harder than the gainers. This is why most reforms have difficulties. Uh, there are many people who gain nothing. There are few who lose. And compensating the losers always turns out to be more expensive than anticipated. And that is one of the major difficulties. And that is why really shaking up the status quo is so extraordinarily difficult. And arguments do not work. That is, to, to achieve real change, you need passion. And passion in a situation that is stable really demands the kind of leadership that can arouse passion and that can get people to accept painful changes in, in the short term. I would like to direct my next question to Professor Arielli and Professor Kahneman. Uh, we talk about leadership, and leadership includes charisma. Now, you can't measure it. You can't exactly define it. But for the voters that need to make the leader a leader, sometimes it's more important than uh, experience, than maybe depth. And it is, in a way, irrational. And irrationality um, is a subject that both of you um, explore. How do you explain the way we surrender to charisma? So uh, first of all, let me say, I think you can measure it. I believe we can measure most things. Uh, accurately is a different question. But um, one of uh, Danny's colleagues at Princeton uh, did a really uh, interesting experiment or study. He, he took American Princeton students 
and he asked him about elections, local elections in Canada. And most Americans know that Canada exists, but that's about it. Um, and he asked him, he showed him the two people who are competing for these elections, and he didn't say who would win. He said, wh whose face looks more trustworthy? And that predicts more than 90% of the, of the votes. So I think you can uh, measure it, and I think it's incredibly superficial, as you suggested, because the fact that the Princeton students can predict the behavior of the Canadians suggests that to some degree the Canadians are choosing based on the same uh, principles, and they also did not uh, expose people to, to a high, high degree. So I think, I think that's, that's a part of the issue. And the, the disturbing thing about all of this is I think that uh, people don't process the arguments very deeply, that when people come to political questions, the questions are really complex and uh, have long-term consequences. And we don't know how to evaluate it, so we resort to simpler cues about what is appropriate. One of them is charisma or the trustworthiness on the face and stuff like that. I agree with Dan. I think uh, we actually know a fair amount about what makes a leader charismatic, and a lot of that is superficial. Uh, people want a leader who looks decisive. So, for example, people want a leader who there is, between the two styles of leadership, a style that is spontaneous and quick and intuitive and a style that is more reflective. Uh, there is a charisma advantage for the more spontaneous one. I think undoubtedly this is a cost that President Obama is paying politically for his highly reflective and thoughtful style of leadership. We prefer people who seem to know what they want to do. We prefer people who induce passion and who induce strong emotion. And that is in part, it comes from something that is really quite primitive. Uh, I, mean, I remember being very impressed by, there was something that President Reagan used to do. Uh, they, they kept showing him walking off his helicopter and he was striding as he was walking off his helicopter. He was just moving with such an impression of confidence. And it was impossible <clears throat> to watch this without feeling this is a decisive leader. This is a leader. So we judge by very superficial things. Uh, and of course, eventually, we judge by results. And sometimes we judge too much by results. But charisma is measurable, and I think we know quite a bit uh, about you know, what tends to produce it. I, I should point out to the professor that uh, the president won two fairly large victories in races that he wasn't supposed to win, so maybe there's a market for thoughtfulness. I hope so. <laughs> I mean, I, my impression, though, is that in the, the reflectiveness didn't work in his favor. No, I look, and uh, that's certainly been a... A, a matter of commentary. I think the other thing, though, is that authenticity matters. If you can be, you can be, um, you can be brash and you can be a, appear to be strong. But if people don't think you're authentic, uh, I, that doesn't matter. And I think one of the reasons the president's done well is that I think people feel he is authentically who he is. That's important in politics. Not you know. Now George Burns once said, "All you need to make it in." Uh, show business is, uh, is uh, sincerity, and if you can fake that, you'll be a great success. So, and you know, it isn't uh, always, uh, it isn't always true that someone who appears authentic is authentic. I mean, by the way, uh, one of the depressing things is that we know what it takes to look sincere. I mean, sincerity can be faked. Ms. Stone, you want to add to that? Well, I think uh, particularly, um, I think that President Obama um, exudes quite a bit of stability, as well as, as President Perez. I think that leadership that um, exudes stability is charismatic. Yeah, I mean, I think it goes back to the, the point that if you have convictions and you believe in those convictions, if you have a vision and you believe in that vision, if you're not casting around for the secret sauce to get yourself elected, I think people sense that. And you know we've had a series of elections where people who were viewed as not uh, as not authentic or not sincerely committed to what they believed lost. Professor Ariely, uh, I was I was going to ask Danny. 
so you had a lot of bleak comments and you had one optimistic issue about leadership. Um, why do you think that leaders are going to be more foresight, uh, have a longer term vision? I mean, do, do you believe that they are more rational, thoughtful, rather than less rational and thoughtful? Or is this just wishful thinking? Uh, you know, they're not necessarily selected for, uh, you know, they're selected for other reasons. They're not necessarily selected for long-term vision. But sometimes nations, states get, get leaders that they need, uh, who some, which sometimes is better leaders than they deserve. And, uh, and those are the kinds of leaders that can move people. One of the things that is really very striking is the ease with which leaders can take countries to war. That really doesn't take much. And uh, I mean, when there is any sort of threat. And I think leaders also can take countries to peace. So, uh, Peace needs leaders, and it needs international support. And Ms. Stone, I would like to ask you, uh, there are quite a few prominent American actors, directors, and singers that are truly devoted to the cause of promoting peace in the Middle East between Israelis and Palestinians. Um, it's important, and they are devoted to it. But sometimes, and I say not, not in most cases, but sometimes there is a notion of oversimplifying a very um, complicated situation and conflict. And um, what comes to mind to me is Michael Moore in the last Oscar award. He said in one of the interviews, um, I can hardly defer between Israelis and Palestinians. You, when he visits in Israel, you look alike. Your language sounds the same. You both eat hummus. One is hummus, one is Hamas, but what does it matter? And so just do it and make peace. And as an Israeli, it sounded to me quite patronizing. And I would like to ask you how, for years now, you successfully promote peace, but avoid from that notion, promoting the cause that's important to you without making the people, you know, the natives here, us feel that you're coming from abroad as a foreigner to, to lecture us, but being part of us. That question is like a marshmallow wrapped in bacon. <laughs> so, um, I'd prefer not to take the question as a whole because I cannot um, take responsibility for the behavior of, of my colleagues uh, in Hollywood, but I can say that uh, I can only speak to my own intentions. But um, given that, I can only say that in my own beliefs, uh, there's an example <clears throat> here in the Middle East and Asia that I believe uh, is very relevant to the world as a whole. I believe that what happens here sets a tone for the world at large and that given that the climate here will set uh, the, the heartbeat of the way the world responds. I, I feel that when you when you live in a, in a, within the same um, geographical confines, it's a lot like a marriage, and you can have a good marriage, you can have a bad marriage, but you're destined to stay together. So, you know, when you see people who are married a long time and they're having a wonderful marriage, it inspires wonderful children, wonderful grandchildren, great success. It's a concentric activity that goes out in the community. When you see people who have a bad marriage and stay together, you see what that kind of example that sets and how it goes out, outward to unhappy children, unhappy grandchildren, children, people who make mistakes in the world. And you know when you see your children picking a partner, you hope that they pick a partner with happy parents. So given this, um, kind of analogy, we uh, in the world want to see this part of the country in a happy marriage. And I think that you can, can uh, set this example. This is, uh, whether, whatever um, 
religious beliefs that anyone has, whether they're um, precise or whether they're, they're uh, looked at as uh, parables, we all know that the desire that we have, whatever look we have to a, a god or a higher power, ultimately it boils down to a desire to set down our burdens and to pick up our spiritual joy and to live in service to a greater good. And with that, the greatest good that we can live is in harmony with our fellow man. So given that this is a central place in the world for that, I believe that if we apply ourselves here, we set that example to our fellow man. Thank you. Mr. Axelrod, I will try to combine between online dating and American politics. Um, during the 2008 um, campaign, one of the, one of the most um, impressive things was the vast use of Twitter, of Facebook, of, uh, of the internet. And it really made an intimate connection between the president and his voters. Now, the advantages and the benefits are obvious, but does it have a cost? I mean, when, when the voters are disappointed, maybe the disappointment is, you know, is higher, is larger? Yeah, I don't know whether that's a function of, uh, it may be accentuated by some of the social media, but I don't think that it is, uh, I mean, disappointments when people have idealized views of people are, um, are common. I, I would say uh, that, uh, by the way, Twitter and was in its infancy in 2008, that technology just has exploded, and so 2012 was much different. Facebook was there, but not as, uh, but it did allow us to create communities of people, um, and yes, they had high hopes, but they also had shared goals for the country, and they formed communities, and those communities endure today, uh, and um, you know, they were there again in 2012, despite whatever disappointments they had, and allowed us to win uh, again. So, um, you know, we, we knew during 2008, we knew the country was so hungry for change, and we knew when we saw hundreds of thousands of people waiting for us at events, um, that it was going to be almost impossible, especially heading into the crisis we saw coming, to meet their expectations. And that was one of, you know, that was just an inevitable uh, uh, challenge that we faced. But I don't think the answer is not to encourage people to dream big dreams for their countries uh, or dream big dreams for their communities. I think that we want to inspire people to believe that we can do better and that's part of the, the role of a leader. Actually, no, I, th I think from, from that perspective and you can connect it to uh, current Israeli politics, that when people get involved I think they think that the promises that politicians made are real. And when, when the politicians encounter the political reality and make different decisions, it's much more disappointing. So, so I think there is um, a, an enhanced level of familiarity. So the, the moment you become friends with uh, a politician, I think the, their word becomes more important. And all of a sudden, even if they have some constraints, you're going to be more, uh, more disappointed. It does go, that your point goes to the point I was making before though. Um, you know, if in a political system, in, inevitably, whatever you uh, can work uh, out is going to be less than perfect. That's the nature of democracy. That's the nature of, of, of progress. And so, um, inevitably, your own supporters are gonna be disappointed. We, you know, there, there's, a, there's a segment of people who are unhappy with the health reform in the U.S., not because it went too far, but because it didn't go far enough, and they were hoping, hoping for more. But it was the reform that we could get, and it's far better than what we have. Um, and so as a politician, you have to recognize that. Um, you know, Sharon, you talked about um, how important love is. Sometimes politicians want love too much. And you got to be willing to sacrifice a little love to make some progress. I mean, it's, it's actually one of the tragedies, I think, of, of political life is that a politician must exaggerate. They must use the rhetoric of solving problem. We have a problem, we're going to solve it. You know, reducing the problem by a little bit, that is very likely what you're going to achieve 
But that rhetoric, the truthful rhetoric, doesn't get people excited. So to get the passion that you need to get elected, to get political power, uh, you in some sense have to promise people promises that you cannot keep. And that is one of the problems of democracy, and it's built in. Well, Mario Cuomo said you campaign in poetry and govern in prose. Yeah. And I think that's about right. And you said that politicians want to be loved, and that's why polls are so important to them. Um, in the past week, there was a poll about the support in President Obama, the lowest uh, since he was reelected. Um, how does a leader, um, how should a leader cope with such polls? I mean, you need to take them into consideration, but you can't be led by them. So how to use them in a wise way? Yeah, I don't think, uh, I, I think that a confident leader, a real leader, um, can't get consumed by those numbers. You want, I think they were more important to us before the election because he wanted to get reelected in order to finish the work he had begun. Um, I don't think now the issue is um, the polls. You want to have enough public support so that you can continue to pass your program. You lose some influence and leverage if your numbers uh, decline. But we're in a very divided country and it sort of limits how your numbers can move. And I think my experience with uh, Obama has been that his, he measures uh, his uh, progress by um, in the long term and not the short term. If we're making progress on the big things that he wants to get done, whether it's health care reform or immigration reform, early childhood education, universal early childhood education, the kinds of things that will create a better future. Frankly, you know, um, it's one of the reasons why he also has been so committed to the, the uh, process of peace here in, in this uh, region. Um, and so I think if every day he can say to himself, we're making progress, even if it's slow and imperceptible toward achieving that goal, then he's not terribly concerned about the polls the moment, but he's an unusual politician. Um, believe me, I've worked, I've done 150 campaigns, I've worked for many, many politicians, uh, and um, the more common reaction is um, panic and despair. So. Professor Arielli, would you like to add up to polls and the psychological side of them, how they influence people and leaders in this case? So, uh, of, of course, we can create polls that get people to answer very differently. So, depending on your political affiliation, you can create whatever poll you want. But uh, if, if I was Danny, I would say that politicians should not read their polls. And, and the reason for that is, or take the analogy of the stock market. The stock market fluctuates, and you don't want to get the day-to-day -day reactions. Or think about something else. Imagine you're in a diet and you could get reading on your diet every moment. This would be really confusing because sometimes you would eat cheesecake and the weight would go down. Sometimes you would drink water, your weight would go up. You really care about the long term. You shouldn't be bothered by the short term. And if you have loss aversion, it means that every time your numbers go down, you get disproportionately upset. So what leaders should do is not really read the polls or maybe get an average of the polls over the last three months, but not get uh, to, is this fair? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, you draw an analogy between that and the advice that psychologists give to investors, which is don't follow, don't track your results too, uh, too frequently, because if you do, you're going to make mistakes. Your mistakes will be driven by loss aversion. You will overreact to losses, so avoid them. Well, and, I can put and, together and a very large self-help group for you guys to address of politicians who... Uh, would reject the idea that they shouldn't be reading polls. But I mean, I, I agree with you. Look, at the end of a career in politics, um, and when you, when you die, you know, the headline you want isn't he averaged 68% approval rating. The headline you want is he made progress on, you know, he, he ended a war. Uh, he made sure that uh, every American had health care. Uh, you want to be, I think, uh, responsible for real progress, um, though that is, you know, that requires putting the day-to-day -day aside and, f and playing the long term, and very, very few leaders or people in public life are willing to make that sacrifice. By the way, I did hear that there was at least one prominent Israeli politician that the journalists believe not only doesn't read the poll, it doesn't read the newspaper. Um, but, but I do have a different uh, question. So Danny basically proposed that for many, many reasons, uh, peace is very difficult. Uh, and 
Uh, part of the issue is the starting point, that we're starting from a point that we have to sacrifice. And it made me uh, think that maybe what we should do is not promote peace, but promote the pilot study. So, so in science, lots of time what we do is we, we're not sure about something, we do a small scale study. And maybe if we think about long-term peace, uh, the sacrifices and the intensity and the duration are just too much. And maybe what we should think in is, is trying something in a small way. But if we'll start something in a small way, the, the starting point would be reversed because all of a sudden we would sacrifice whatever we're going to sacrifice and things would, would be different. So maybe, maybe the approach is not to promote long-term goals but some short-term uh, attempts. And that's, that I think is very interesting. Uh, and interestingly enough, the psychology of it is that it may be difficult for the other side to accept. Because one thing that the, the Palestinians do not want, they do not want their cage gilded. That is, they do not want local improvements. They're afraid that by accepting local improvements, you know, they are giving up on their long-term goals. So there the psychology, the psychological problem was shift to the other side. I completely agree with you that a demonstration project that would be supported by the leadership and that would be accepted as having both symbolic and, and sort of educational value might be a very good thing to do. But therein lies and the challenge for the leader is to how do you frame these things to address these psychological barriers and reframe them in ways that are Acceptable. And here, clearly, you need leadership on both sides. I mean, leadership on one side is clearly not sufficient. So, uh, the other side has psychological problems of its own. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Axelrod um, described the, the courage as a very important quality of a leader. Ms. Stone, what do you see as important qualities and assets of a good leader, a real leader? I, I feel that a good leader stays in the present. A good leader does not stay mired in the past. Although a good leader needs to look at all of the requests of the past. When a good leader comes to the table, it's important to look at all of the requests that have come to the table in the past. It's because it is so easy to look at that and say, you've come to, to the table with 437 requests. Perhaps I can give you 300 of them today. Because to just keep saying no is a, relentless, it's like a wheel stuck in the mud. Sometimes we can just give things just in an opportunity of gratitude for the possibility to meet. Sometimes we can just stay in, a, in the possibility of the gratitude of the meet. And we have to stay present in, the, in, the, in, in gratitude of the possibility of today. That's the way to move forward in, in the now. I think good leaders stay present in now and look at today as a refreshed day and let go of the demands of, of the past and are free to give away the demands of the past and not keep hanging on out of principle. I think good leaders stay in an ability to release themselves into a new day. If you could give advice to the Israeli and Palestinian leaders, one good advice, what would it be at this point? I don't think it is my place to be giving advice to the leaders of these two countries, but I think more because I'm in a position of the individual. I would give advice to the individuals of the country to say, if you rise up and have the courage to say that you want to be free, that you want to have peace, then your leader will hear what you want. And it's and it's interesting because we started this discussion with the importance of the leaders and we're now concluding in the importance of the individuals as well. So in a way, do you see it as a balance between, between the two? Well, the leaders are leading someone, aren't they? Professor Kahneman? I have nothing to add to that. Thank you very much, Ms. Taryn Stone, Professor Kahneman, Mr. Axelrod, and Professor Ariely for being with us this morning.